overlooking Islamabad from the Murgala Hills. It's a beautiful view, especially at night. But see if you can spot what's happening down below. What you're seeing is the effect of power outages on the city. Sector by sector, the electricity is cut off for an hour at a time, for several hours every day. Pakistan's electricity network is struggling to fulfill the country's power requirements, and it's wreaking havoc with people's lives, destroying jobs, and even affecting education. For those without generators or UPS systems, the high summer temperatures, coupled with no power to run fans or air conditioners, make it near impossible to sleep at night and difficult to work or study during the day. To further add insult to injury, as the power outages have grown, electricity bills have also risen sharply over the years, adding further strain to Pakistani household budgets. Occasionally, the frustration, especially among the impoverished and worst affected, boils over into anger and riots on the streets of Pakistan's cities. This was the city of Faisalabad earlier this month, where furious residents attacked government offices in protest over the situation and were then themselves beaten by police. The energy crisis really highlights class divisions in Pakistan. The most affluent areas like Islamabad tend to suffer fewer power outages. Here in Rawalpindi, Islamabad's bigger neighbour with many working class areas, the power goes out for around 12 hours a day. But rural areas have it the worst, where the power is off more than it's on, with up to 18 or even 20 hours of load shedding a day. This is a printing press in Rawalpindi's southern district. Like many small businesses dependent on the main supply, work comes to a standstill several times a day as the power goes off, the workers left languishing in the heat. By the time we're ready to start our interview, the power has indeed been cut, to nobody's surprise. For the last few weeks, as the temperature has risen, load shedding has been even worse than normal here. Load shedding is a lot of life for people. So, the machinery of the printing is running on the machine. So, when the machine doesn't work, it's a lot of damage from this. The reason is that the machine is put on the lack of machinery, so we won't do the work, so what do we do in the future? So, it's a lot of damage. Here, the amount of damage that we have in our lives, we don't know how much damage we have in our lives. There are 2 or 3 hours of light. How many hours of light are there? How many hours of load shedding are there? How many hours of load shedding? तंगी है हमें इस चीज़ से हमारी रिक्वेस्ट ये इनसे अकुमत से आने वाली से कि बराए मेहरबानी सबसे पहले यही काम करें कि लोड शेडिंग खत्म करें हमारी ये अंधेरा आपके सामने पड़ा हुआ है। The power outages have been ongoing for several years, worsening under the last government. They've crippled businesses and industry, particularly those unable to afford to run their own generators. But there's another destructive consequence to this crisis. This is the University of Management and Technology in Lahore. It boasts more than 6,000 students and an excellent academic record. But here too, life has become an exercise in frustration as the students find their lessons interrupted and scientific experiments disrupted. This happens mostly in the lab because we have lab for three consecutive hours, right? And uh, a lab is like ongoing throughout because there are a lot of students, a lot of classes, so a lot of labs going on. So whenever uh, like there is a uh, power failure, the students who were already taking the data, they're all lost because they have to go through the same system again to the forefront where they started it and take that data again because it, it's like consecutive data that is coming. Because they have just three hours lab and they have to perform one experiment and uh, they might be unable to perform that. Students physically suffer as well because you see when I'm taking a lecture, I suffer myself physically because I'm unable to deliver the lecture with no light or light coming in and out. I have the multimedia on for one and a half hour if I teach in a room which is having a temperature of like 40 or 41 or 46 like nowadays it's going on. So I would not be able to deliver my lecture with the same energy as I would have with the better uh, environment. Same as the with the student, they're going to lack concentration. To help, the university has been working to reduce overall power usage and investing vast sums of money into newer and bigger generators that can match the main supply. 
but that's money that would have otherwise gone towards improving educational facilities. While the university has to incorporate the research and development scholarships and everything area like that, their um, priority would be shifted towards uh, taking control of the uh, electricity and taking control of the energy. When I see the student, they say, okay, uh, this is the thing, how do we study? We don't have light at home, we don't have light over here. So how can we study actually? And they're losing their interest towards uh, uh, the studies because the, the environment is not friendly at all. So if the environment is not friendly at all, they might be losing more of their interest and it would be badly, badly affecting our young generation. But of course, it's the rural areas that are hit hardest. This is Maksud Elahi, proud grandfather of two. He lives in the village of Sud Gangal, west of Rawalpindi where the summer temperature sits at around 45 degrees Celsius. He remembers a time when the electricity supply was relatively reliable and the electricity bill reasonable. facilities and the chronic energy shortages are not limited solely to electricity. Many vehicles in Pakistan, especially small ones like this and public transport like taxis, vans and buses run on compressed natural gas. It's a much cheaper alternative to petrol, but it too is being rationed. Here in Punjab province, at best, the gas stations are open for three or four days a week, and this is the queue to get in. This is a quiet period. On Monday mornings, when the gas pressure is first turned on, the queue can stretch for half a mile, leaving drivers standing in line for hours. The gas shortages also hit domestic supplies, Households in rural areas, again, the worst affected. Mazar is a Rawalpindi taxi driver. He doesn't earn particularly much, but he's finding his income being squeezed even further, as natural gas is rationed and customers are unhappy about paying more to cover the raised costs of running on petrol. I don't gas gas और हमारे कस्टमर हैं उनको भी सबको परेशानी है यानी ये हमें सबसे ज्यादा है क्योंकि हमारे बच्चों का यही रोजगार है हमारा और कोई है नहीं है तो इस तरह घरेलू चीजें भी देख रहे जो जरूरत है जिंदगी है वो भी सारी चीजें आप दाल कर ले आटा कर ले घी कर ले पहले 300 जोजुरतमंदोवैसे it's worth mentioning that in Pakistan, vehicles are retrofitted with CNG kits of varying quality, and substandard gas cylinders have led to explosions in the past with fatal consequences. But its affordability means the working classes have little choice but to use CNG. So what's going on? Why is Pakistan, a nuclear power that had a surplus of electricity production a decade ago, today unable to fulfill the basic energy needs of its own citizens. Let's start with electricity. The installed 
power generation capacity in the country is about in excess of 20,000 megawatts and the demand is about 16 to 17,000 maximum. So we should, if the, all the installed capacity is in operation, we should be generating more than the required amount of electricity. Dr. Samar Mubarak Mand is a well-respected nuclear physicist and energy expert, at one point the head of Pakistan's Atomic Energy Commission. He played a leading role in developing Pakistan's nuclear capability. Today he's working on developing new power projects to secure the country's energy needs in the long term. He says the failure of previous governments to invest in new energy projects is part of the problem, while existing power plants are not in good health. On top of that, the government doesn't pay power companies on time, so they don't pay fuel companies on time, who then don't supply enough fuel to run the power plants at full capacity. Average power generation cost from our plants, uh, all our sources, is uh, at the moment about 15 cents per unit. The government sells this power to the consumer at 10 cents per unit. Now, first problem, that is, uh, a wastage of electricity down the transmission lines and uh, inefficient transformers and as well as uh, corruption at the collection end, uh, the revenue collection end where people do not pay their bills, big industrialists do not avoid paying their bills, people sitting in parliament have large land estates, they don't pay their bills on their tube bills and on their industrial meters and so on. So this uh, amount, loss of uh, recovery of revenue amounts to about 45 percent. So out of the um, 10 rupees per, 10 cents per unit, the government only gets five and a half cents. So when this huge gap per unit is being suffered as a loss by the government, th this mounts the circular debt issue very rapidly. Pakistan's circular debt for energy production has now reached $5 billion. The new government came to power promising to resolve the energy crisis and is acutely aware of the public's expectations. It's now announced plans to clear the debt within the next two months, but that alone will not be enough. If the government clears the past debt now, as they say they will do it within 60 days or so on, the new debt will again pile up. So first of all, they have to pull up their socks on the administrative side and recover the full cost of electricity which, they, which the people are billed. So that is an administrative issue. But secondly, the power generation cost has to come down from 15 cents to 10 cents or even lower so that government can make a little profit on what the power they sell. But with the cost of electricity now so high, how can the price be brought down to a level that Pakistan's working classes can afford? In future, we don't want to use furnace oil, which has become very costly, uh, and use the coal instead of uh, furnace oil for power generation. Because we have our own coal in Thar, uh, uh, which will be mined shortly and which will be uh, available in three to four years' time. But in the meantime, if we immediately replace those boilers with coal-fired boilers, and we import coal, and we use imported coal on those boilers, up to the time till the, our own coal from Thar is made available, then uh, we can have uh, about an additional six to 7,000 megawatts right away within a period of about two and a half years. Most important source of renewable energy which, which I can think of in Pakistan is that the water is coming down from the rivers, uh, down the rivers uh, from a height of something like 6,000 meters to sea level. And this uh, tremendous uh, potential energy, source of potential energy, as in physics we call it, is, is available to us for exploitation, which we have not yet exploited. Of course, it's true that we have built very large dams like the Mangla Dam and the Tarbela Dam. And each of these dams uh, take 10 years to build and the feasibility takes five years and so on. And they uh, cost mammoths, costing hundreds, uh, ten, tens of billions of dollars. Uh, but um, uh, in the extreme north of Pakistan, in the Sabat area, there are lots of small streams when the glaciers melt, this water flows down into the Sabat river in the valley, in the bottom of the valley. And people over there on a cooperative basis have set up small turbines and generators on these small uh, streams of water. And after sunset, everybody in their homes, they have free electricity because they contribute equally to the generators. So this is a concept which is also practiced uh, all over the world in many countries of the world where there is uh, fast flowing water in streams and rivers and canals. And Pakistan has a potential of about 50,000 megawatts 
to be generated from our fast flowing rivers and, uh, and streams and the in investment went in these projects is not very high in china they have put rubber buffer dams across rivers and they uh, inflate them with compressed air and they stop the water and they have a fall of about 20 30 meters and they would have put up turbines downstream and they generate power so it doesn't cost very much but we have to experiment on these and we have to define this technology this is the only way to go if you keep getting oil from the middle east we are going to get sink deeper and deeper into circular debt issue which ultimately translates into our imf loans In terms of Pakistan's gas shortage, experts are divided on how to proceed. But Dr. Mubarak Mand believes the answer lies at home. By the time the Iranian gas, if the if the gas pipeline is commissioned in the two years time, and we get gas from Iran, the gas from Iran, the the, the shortage will be about twenty two fifty two thousand two hundred fifty mm CFT per day. and iranian gas pipeline line will provide 750 which is one third of the shortage yeah. so it will only meet 30% of our shortage at that time in two years time and at what cost at the moment our gas is about uh, $5 dollars per mm btu iranian gas is at the moment 15 dollars per mm btu it's three times the cost of our own natural gas so uh, we have suggested to the government that we go for intensive underground coal gasification in the thar coal fields where the coal is very amenable to gasification which we have in plenty is 175 billion tons we may resort to mining of that coal certainly for power generation but we can also do gasification of this coal and utilize this gas coal gas for power generation for diesel production for methanol production for fertilizer production for plastics for pharmaceuticals and there are 20 different elements you can items you can produce from coal gas and of course you can use it for burning in the home in domestic kitchens some environmental groups have expressed concern about burning coal to meet pakistan's energy needs and are worried about the construction of two new nuclear power plants which will add to pakistan's existing three But after years of load shedding and price hikes, the average Pakistani is for the moment more concerned with getting the lights back on and at an affordable price than with how that power is generated. It's obvious that administrative corruption both at lower and higher levels needs to be tackled. The industrialists, landowners and even government institutions that refuse to pay their bills brought to book. and ultimately a competent long-term plan for Pakistan's energy needs put in place if things are to get any better what happens next is down to the new government of prime minister nawaz sharif but back in the village of sud gangal maksud elahi has a warning for the politicians in islamabad ummeed to hai dekho agar ye inhone hame insaan samjha kuch to shayad allah taala inke dilon mein rehm dal de aur ye kuch kaam kar le nahi inka ishar bhi wahi hoga जो इस हुकूमत के साथ हुआ है हसन गानी फॉर द रियल न्यूज़ रावलपिंडी पाकिस्तान